You know what's so funny about that dude is uh, is because because in my in another life for me as well, I was a pretty high ranking uh, uh, pretty high ranking officer in the Hooters of America. Company. Yes, Hooters of America. Yeah, and 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 even when I was at the store level as as a GM, when I was at that level, like I would meet guys and they'd be like, "Dude, you're so lucky, man. You got you got the best <laughs> job in the world." And I'm like, "Okay, you want to know what it's like to be me?" And they'd like, "What?" I'm like, "Okay." Go back to your hometown in your head. They're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, remember that girl, the one prom queen? Remember her? Remember her? Yeah. All right, now multiply her by 50 and yeah. now tell her no all day. That's what I do for a living. Yeah. You really want that job? And how many people thought you just had the best job in the world? And you're like, bro, you have no clue. It's 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 <laughs> so like leading a group of very qualified, like my company now, Men of Action, we only hire the best. We had 800 people apply to do sales for us and we've hired 1% of them. Yeah. And the guys we have are super A players. I mean, this is Delta Force, Navy SEAL, level highest quality individuals uh, that come and work for us. And then working in the strip club, it was like nothing, none of that. There was no qualifications. You're dealing with someone who has like no level of responsibility and no one's ever told them no before. And now escaping the drift, the show designed to get you from where you are to where you want to be. I'm John Gafford, and I have a knack for getting extraordinary achievers to drop their secrets to help you on a path to greatness. So stop drifting along, escape the drift, and it's time to start right now. Back again, back again, back again. Man, I'm, it seems like I say this every week, but we're just booking the best guests, man. We're booking people that can just pour into you knowledge that is just going to alter the way that you think and change the way that, man, you just operate. And this next guy got in the studio today, this cat, you know, there's that one dude in every town where you live. There's like, there's this, there's this dude. And you're like, every time you turn around, this is the dude that just walks by the bouncers into the club. This is the dude that hosts every big event. He's the, he's like, he's the guy, right? He's just the dude. And I got to tell you, I'm not talking about Topeka, Kansas. I'm talking about Las Vegas. And to be that dude in this town, there's some science behind it. You just don't accidentally become that guy. And this guy has cracked that code. He has delivered that science. He can tell you and teach you how to build an incredible social network. He is the founder of the Men, in, Men of Action coaching program, Las Vegas' own. What's up, Michael Sartan? How are you, buddy? What's going on, man? It's funny you say that. There is a science. There's it is a science. A science. It, it just it literally is a science. It's not like a, just a charisma thing. There is an actual the guys who you know that go by the bouncer, that the guys who have the huge events, the guys who show up to a, a, a you know an event with 30, 40 girls, the guys yeah. who get invited on stage to do different things, ignite or expire or uh, what's it called uh, um, the, the the elevator nights, yeah, or TEDx talks about. There is a science to it. It's yeah. not people think oh it's just luck. No, it's just you learn from the right people and then you you get there as your, yourself well let's back up dude because obviously all the high producers we have in here and high achievers we have you know that come through from through the studio here i always like to start back with what made you you because i'm always curious let's, let's get back to like is it nature is it nurture tell me about young michael sartain uh, I was, I would say I was, you know, really awkward in junior high and high school. I was strong enough to play like offensive line in football and I was pretty good at that, but I was, uh, I was always really uncoordinated mm -hmm. and I got made fun of a lot in uh, junior high and high school, went to college. Uh, and when I went there, you know, at, at UT Austin, uh, I had a great time. I love it. I'm a longhorn to, you know, I'm, hopefully we'll win the national championship here in a couple of weeks. Jesus. Uh, I even, okay. <laughs> but I'm, I'm a longhorn through and through. And, uh, and when I was there, can I stop you for a yeah. second? Do you feel that the right teams got placed in the final? Four? This is funny. Let's have this conversation. So it's it's a it's a paper rock scissors situation. You can't have Alabama without having Texas. It's not possible because Texas beat Alabama. Yes, Texas is a power five in a power five conference and won their championship, and Alabama did too. So I agree with Texas. Yeah, I agree with. You Texas. don't agree with Alabama? No. But they won. But the problem is they won a power five conference. If so they, did if they Flor Florida State was undefeated right, in but, a Power 5 conference. Right, but their strength of schedule was so much less than the other four. It doesn't matter. It doesn't and, matter. So, as somebody, okay, because I'm going to say this. Yeah. Listen, first so of all, let, think, me, so let you, me. You think Alabama, you think yes. that Florida State should have been instead of Alabama. What, without question. What, what, while I understand what you're saying, there's also a lot of money involved, and that game would have been 49 to nothing. 
Like what game? Florida State playing anyone. Did you watch Florida State versus Louisville? That was embarrassing. They look like a high school. Okay. Like like Army has no, a no, better no, offense. No, no, than no, no, no. That. Stop, stop, yeah. stop, stop. Because you're, you're missing a point. Yeah. Yes, I watched the game because yeah. I've watched every Florida State game since yeah. I was five years old. Yeah. So, yes, I did see the game. And the point is, that was a third string quarterback yes. making his first start as a freshman that will not play. So you're playoff. saying in the bowl game they get their second string In the bowl game, you're going to bet. Yeah, he, had a, he was in c- concussion protocol. He doesn't have a broken leg. Yeah. Right? Absolutely not. And you know what else I saw? I saw a defense that after your starting quarterback defense went out, awesome. gave up 1.3 points per quarter for the rest of the season. Yeah, no, the defense is awesome. So do I think it's going to be 49 nothing against somebody? Absolutely not. I think Florida State versus Georgia right now would be 49 nothing. I think they We're they, going to find out. I think we're going to find we're going to find out. Trouble, we're going to find out. Oh yeah, we will. We're going to find but out. No, I, I think it's a great I think it's a great thing. I thought that the committee wanted to leave Texas. So here's out. my qu- No, no, no. I But they I, couldn't. Like it was so inconvenient. 100%. They wanted to leave 100%. Texas out but they couldn't because Texas beat out. 100%. They yeah. like the problem is Anyway, ESPN was going to have their SEC school, and it's what they're. That's my point. Yeah, exactly. Like, understand. You have to. These people do. You and I make money for a living. At some point, our guests have to provide some kind of value, either because they're interesting or they have a following or whatever. There is a money component when we're dealing with massive amounts of money. I just don't know that Florida State would have been as competitive as these. I just would not have liked Florida State versus Michigan. But as a kid that grew up playing the game, of course, of course. What do you tell those kids? Like, what do you? It's terrible. I tell tell them to you play tell? tell them to play a tougher schedule. That's what I would tell them to do. What are you talking about? They played they played two SEC schools, including the Heisman Trophy winner, yeah. and made him look like a fucking joke. A lot of people made him game. look like a joke, though. Yeah. To be stat, to be fair, he, that, to, to be fair, batter. LSU looked like a joke. Stat a times. right? Yeah. But but anyway, yeah. What else do you want them to do? They, they're 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 non conference schedule. They played no FCS school. Yeah, for sure. None of them. They were all FBS schools. They played Georgia. I'm sorry. They played uh, LSU in a in a non home game. There, there's a Precedent Come for on. this. Do you remember the uh, the the Sweet Sixteen or the uh, the NCAA tournament for basketball? Kenyon Martin he yeah. hurts himself right before Cincinnati is supposed this. to go, and they they take him away from a one seed and make him like a three seed. You remember that, that? wasn't an undefeated team, and they right. still got a chance. I, I'm to play. with you. I'm just saying they still the, got a chance. The, the, pre- right. the precedent was money. The precedent <laughs> it, was money. Hundred yeah. percent, which yeah. was which is nonsense and terrible. And I find it really funny they just announced that uh, college game day is going to go because Florida State is kicking off the season next year in Ireland against Wake Forest. That's beautiful. And game day is going to show up. It's going to be. It'll be unbroadcastable. Yes, they'll I'm be so the drunk. Fans by, no, the fans behind them getting yeah. on getting on. Herb Street, it's going to be unwatchable. How about Lee Corso falling, like, probably? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, they, might, I, might, I might mean, they, what did the over-under leave and makes it to next year? But anyway, let's get back to what yeah. we're talking about. So you're a guy that maybe maybe you didn't have, you weren't the guy in high school. So, so uh, well, here's the thing. Uh, last year, so senior in college. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's really weird. So you guys have to understand, before 05, the world is different. You yeah. remember, oh, because yeah. there was no myspace or facebook before mm-hmm. of the world was different in fact before 04 there was no text messaging or hdtv or bottle service we didn't have nightclub bot- where girls had sparklers people forget I, we, we, me and my friends were trying to remember when did bottle service start and we couldn't remember now in europe it had started far before it started in the u.s but it started kind of the 0304 time period with um some clubs in New York. I think Jason Strauss had something to do with mm-hmm. it. And then it started taking off around the country where you could sell a bottle that would cost you $50 for 2,600. Yeah. And then you would make all of that was a markup. Well, no, 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 no. Okay. Cause no, 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 no. Cause I, I was the operating, uh, I ran, uh, what was deemed by Esquire magazine, the number one nightclub on the East coast of the United States. Okay. And that was Cobalt Lounge uh, before where Ray Lewis had his mishap during yes, Super Bowl yeah, 2000, yeah. right? And we were, at that point, yeah, you know what? I think you're probably right because I, I want to say that we were selling bottles, but we weren't. What we would do is when, on Sunday nights when Jermaine Dupree would have his party, we would auction off, we would auction off bottles yes. of, of – uh, not Vuv. How am I thinking of? Uh, shit. Crystal. Spade, we Crystal. Would, uh, Crystal. Yeah. yeah, but way before I said we would auction off the Crystal. So yeah, you're right. We didn't have we didn't have it then. Yeah, yeah because right. because some some bright guy realized what we're selling is real estate. What we're not selling yeah. is actually the bottle. Yeah, yeah. Well, the bottle is the ticket to the real estate, but the real estate is the dance floor table. Yeah. And when that happened, everything changed. Everybody. It was a common I'm telling you right now, when we go back and look back at this time period 50 years from now, mm-hmm. it is going to be text messaging. The iPhone, it's going to be bottle service and social media. Those things changed the dating lifestyle. The social construct. It changed the entire social construct of the country. It, in, uh, it's partially to do with the increased divorce rate. It has to do with people cheating. It has to do with the fact that six out of 1,000 women are getting married now. It, 
everything goes back to those things I just mentioned. Yeah. And it, it's, it's just ma social media, obviously more social media would be 75% of it all by itself, yeah. but it's such a massive amount of stimulus. And anyway, we go back to what I was saying. I started DJ, I started uh, DJing at a strip club in 2000. And when I was there, this was the first time that I actually saw the difference between, uh, it was one of these situations where it, every man goes through this. Sure. This is what women are telling me. Yep. And then this is what women are doing. And being in the locker room, and you literally got to see yes, behind the curtain. Be in the <laughs> locker room at a strip club, and these girls were like my friends. Like my money depended on them being happy, yeah. them showing up on time. They, it was not. There was no sexual flirting. It was yeah. a very much a biz. I was an offensive coordinator. That's sure. the best way to just, a DJ at a strip club is an offensive coordinator. It's the best way to describe it. And I, I did this for four years, and then then they made I had a, you know had a, uh, a business degree, so they made me the manager of the club. At at one point, I was one of the managers, and and from there, I learned what like like were what. Um, massive difference in leadership. I know it sounds crazy because I'm talking about strippers, but like yeah. you're seeing some of the worst, most irresponsible humans you've ever met and trying to motivate them is fucking hard. You know, in the Marine Corps, if you're like, they take the guy who's the most irresponsible and they make him the squadron leader. Sure. Yeah. It's one of those kind of things. And it was, it was like, you're just kind of learning these, these things. 9-11 happens while I'm, I'm there from 01 to 04. Where, where was this? This was Austin, Texas. Okay, it's cool. uh it's called the red rose. Now it used to be called expose when okay. I worked there. And then I worked at Palazzo and then I worked at sugars in, um, in, um, in Austin. And then I, you know, I watched nine 11 happen and I knew immediately I was going to join the military. I just saw it as soon as the towers yeah, yeah, came real, down. Real quick. You know, what's so funny about that dude is, uh, is cause, cause in my, in another life for me as well, I was a pretty high ranking, uh, uh pretty high ranking officer in the Hooters of America. Company. Yes. Hooters of America. Uh, and, and, and even when I was at the store level as, as a GM, when I was at that level, like I would meet guys and they'd be like, dude, you're so lucky, man. You got, you got the best <laughs> job in the world. And I'm like, okay, you want to know what it's like to be me? And they'd like, what? I'm like, okay, go back to your hometown in your head. They're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, remember that girl, the one prom queen, remember her, remember her? Yeah. All right. Now multiply her by 50 and yeah. now tell her no all day. That's what I do for a living. Yeah. You really want that job? And how many people thought you just had the best job in the world? And you're like, bro, you have no clue. It's, it's, it's so <laughs> like leading a group of very qualified, like my company now, men of action, we only hire the best. We had 800 people apply to do sales for us and we've hired 1% of them. Yeah. And the guys we have are super a players. I mean, this is Delta force Navy seal level highest quality individuals uh, that come and work for us. And then working in the strip club, it was like nothing, none of that. There was no qualifications. You're dealing with someone who has like no level of responsibility and no one's ever told them no before. And so it also, when you yeah. go back to Hooters, you're talking about Hooters 20 years ago. Yeah. Hooters 20 years ago is very different from Hooters now. Oh dude, it was yeah. like a fraternity. No, yeah. this was Hooters 30 years ago. Yeah, so. Hooters 30. <laughs> so here's another thing. Remember, Hooters 30 years ago, yeah. there's no social media. When Hooters, yeah. first, yeah, some yeah. of you guys will not believe me when I say this, but John will attest to this. When Hooters first opened, the hottest girls in your city worked, worked at Hooters. All of them. It, all of them. Yep. They're, because people were not, strip clubs were still considered to be seedy back then yep. in the 90s. Uh, nobody, there was no social media, and girls were like, uh, in, in night, we didn't have bottle service in nightclubs. Yep. So you didn't have a bottle service waitress making 200K That's a year right. back then. So the best gig you could get, and there was no OnlyFans, the best gig you could get was to work at Hooters. Yeah. Once those other things started coming, like once strip clubs started turning into steakhouses and like pseudo nightclubs, yeah, yeah. And once social media came out, uh, and then once girls started to be able to make money as influencers online, then then Hooters just like yeah, they done. do not have Good the luck. hottest girls, Good luck. not even close now. And I, that's that's I the main been Hooters in twenty years. Yeah, it's, that's that's it. what happened. But people don't believe me. Like, dude, the Rhino before social media came out was insane. I can only imagine, bro, uh, dude. Before. I can't even describe to you. Like I remember the hundred hottest women I'd ever seen in my life, and I've been to the Playboy Mansion several times. Yeah, seventy-five of them worked at the Rhino. It was the crazy. Now it's not, not. Not to knock the Rhino, I love the Rhino. Rhino's still the best strip club in the world, and Sapphire probably one one in one A right there. Yeah. Uh, and and I will tell you right now, like it's not like that anymore. Like there's all kinds of girls, but back then it was just crazy. Anyway, the point the point I'm trying to make is, you know, you start learning these things about dynamics. I joined the military, and then it's the complete opposite. Now I'm dealing with very responsible people. I'm in yeah. a flying squadron. I'm flying a KC KC-135 Strato tanker as a navigator, and I'm also I have a troop of men that work for me because I'm an officer, yeah. and I uh, and I also become I, I work start working in counterintelligence. So I start doing all these things while I'm in the military, and it's very structured for me, and it's something that I needed. I needed that level of yep. structure. Uh, so there's two opposite sides. Just imagine managing a strip club and then I'm an officer in the military. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Right. So it's like, it's, it's these two, I'm just being molded from two different sides, if that makes sense. Yeah. When I get out, I wanted to do something that was very not 
military-like. So I was going to move to LA and I was going to go work for a talent agency and I was going to try to book talent and I was going to try to act. I was going to do both of those things. I was going to acting classes, whatever. And I found out what most, a lot of people who live here in Las Vegas find out, which is Las Vegas, Los Angeles sucks. It's a terrible place to live. They take all your money. The standard of living is low. The, qual the, the cost of living is high. The taxes are outrageous. There's homelessness and crime everywhere. It's whatever you guys think of LA, it's actually worse. It actually yeah. is. There's no pretty girls there. I know I'm going to say this and it's going to blow people's mind. The pretty girls live in Bel Air. They live in Anaheim. They live in a, like a few of them. They live in Temecula. Not they do not live in Hollywood. A few of them. Yeah. A couple. There's some girls up in like maybe Encino and NoHo, but those are porn stars. There's no <laughs> hot shit. girls in Los Angeles. I know you guys are going to think I'm full of shit. It, I'm uh, telling you. It's bro, true. Santa listen. Monica. Yes. Definitely Santa Monica. Yeah. Palisades. Yes. Malibu. Tons of hot girls. Los Angeles is like Los Angeles is more dangerous than Baltimore. It is crazy how bad Los Angeles is now. So I got I got fed up with it. I'd say 2012 to 2014, I was doing the LA thing, quit, and then I just full time Las, Las, Las Vegas. And when I was here, I started working with a nightlife, like a pro, event promoter. Yeah. And it was great because I was like an intern for them and they helped me skip several levels. So instead of going from like low level promoter, which I was never a promoter, but like those guys are kind of at the bottom of the barrel in a nightclub, well, right? Well, that's like John Gray will tell you getting stuck to George's hip at the Palms when they first. There you go. So you, you understand. Yeah. yeah, John, yeah same John's thing. great. John yeah, is John's thing. dating my friend Jamie. And like I, I got to meet him for the first time in Dallas. He's great. He's yeah, in real estate now, dude. uh, John. So, so in that, that kind of situation, so you're with these, I, I'm, I'm interning with these guys and they show me how to throw these events and, and I'm watching them do it. The problem is with them, the other promoters that I met and all the VIP hosts in the city is they treat women like cattle. They literally treat women like their currency and they treat them like cattle. And I just came up with this idea one day and I was like, I remember being in the strip club when I was working at the strip club and there was this one day where one of the girls had a birthday party and I was like, well, you know, and I, I used to be, uh, I used to be the head door guy at this one nightclub and the, all the staff went to another nightclub and it was the new hot new nightclub in Austin, Texas. This is Austin. Yeah, it's Austin, Texas. So this would be, let's say 2002. And this is like Congress and sixth Avenue. So it goes Congress and sixth street. Okay. And so we go to this nightclub and I show up with 10 girls and they're all the strippers that work with me and they're there for a birthday party. And I remember just thinking, you know, I'm not trying to, I had a girlfriend at the time. I wasn't like trying to hook up with any of them. And I just remember women coming up and talking to me and like constantly like the hottest girls that I didn't even know. I showed up with 10 girls and even more girls came up and like wanted to know who I was. And I was like, there's something here. I don't know what this is, but it seems like when I'm around a bunch of hot girls, more hot girls want to talk to me. And I kept that thought for like 20 years. And then in 2015, I'm at a party with Ty Lopez. And this is the first time I ever met Ty and me and Ty are good friends now. And Ty, he explains to me, he shows me his book list. And in his book list, there's these group of books by a guy named Dr. David M. Buss from the University of Texas at Austin. He has a, a undergrad from uh, Harvard and a PhD from Berkeley. Okay. And, and I'm like, okay, I need to learn about, he, he teaches this thing called evolutionary psychology. In evolutionary psychology, there's these two theories. One of them is called sexy son's hypothesis, which is the concept of if you see a man and that man, if a woman sees a man and that man has uh, uh, attractive traits, the woman wants to mate with him subconsciously, totally under, like under the radar, subconsciously, covertly, not covertly, but subconsciously wants to mate with him because of our hypergamy algorithm. And so that he, she can get those genes in her children. So her children will have more children. And the second theory is called uh, mate choice copying, which is the concept of when women see men with a lot of women, then they want to be around that man. And we, that's not just with homo sapiens. That's with primates. We've seen that with avian. We've seen that with birds. They've done it with geese. Well, they've actually put in stuffed animal, female geese next to a male and the other females want to hang out with them. They've done it with rodents. It seems to be something with like, like vertebrates when females see a male surrounded by women, they want to be around him. And then we call it the, you know, the, the, What's it called? The, uh, like you hear, you go see your favorite boy band and then all of a sudden all the girls are screaming. Yeah. The women are like turned on by hearing these other women scream for this individual. So I was like this concept of mate choice copying. I was like, what if this is a crazy idea? What if there was a way for me to get hundreds of girls to go to events with me, but I was never an asshole to them. I didn't have to act like a narcissist or a psychopath or anything like that. I didn't have to act like Machiavellian, but I just generated attraction by maintaining masculine frame, maintaining my boundaries, and then having tons of pre-selection or what we sure. refer to as mate choice copying. Would that work? That was a, a hypothesis I had in 2011, and I've tried it for the last 
uh, you know, 12 years and I could tell you unequivocally, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely generate massive amounts of attraction with women and actually get a lot of women to comply, to like do whatever you, uh, to, to go to the events that you want, to help support your <laughs> charity events, whatever. You can get them to do that by by using the, those ideas. And then then I then I started wondering like- Well, let's stop, let's stop though. Cause, cause yeah. you, you gotta get the first one. Yes. <laughs> and, that, and I think there's probably a lot of people like, well, how do I get the first? I mean, yeah, yeah. it's what you roll up with a gaggle of 20, 20 women. Yeah, I get it. I get why people think you're the man. Yes. How do I just get one? Beautiful. So <laughs> the thing is, what you'll find is a lot of guys who have trouble in this area of their life, they get friend zoned all the time. Yeah. Well, that actually you can use to your advantage. Mm -hmm. What you do in this case is like what they, which what needs to be seen for pre-selection, the woman doesn't have to, be, have to be attracted. She just has to show some level of compliance. So you walking in with 20 girls, you're not sleeping with all 20 girls. Mm. Unless but you're Dan Balzerian. Yeah, maybe. but no, but like I talked to Dan about this the other day and it's the same thing with him. Like he'll, he'll walk in with 20 girls and he slept with six of them, but he didn't sleep with all 20. He'll tell me, he's like, I didn't sleep with all 20 of them, Yeah, you know? Uh, but he'll, he'll, they'll walk in and he gets this high level of compliance. The first thing I recommend for guys to do is find six female friends that you friend zone, you friend zone them. Great reason is they're married. They might not be your type. I have a very, I like very much athletic builds with large fake boobs. Like that's very much my type. If a girl doesn't have that, like she's kind of skinny fat or, you know, she doesn't have fake boobs or whatever, <laughs> then I'm not, I'm just not a, a, attracted. Right. I put her right in the friend zone. Yeah. And then now I invite 50 of those girls to something. I put them in the friend zone. They guess what they do. Three things. They make you very comfortable being around women. Okay. They get you into every single party you could ever want. And they introduce you to more women. Those three things happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And then one of the other things I learned was, so I would go to these self-help conferences and what do you see in there? Nothing but men. It's just men. So I started showing up to like, I would go see Owen Cook speak or I'd go see Ty Lopez speak and I'd bring like six girls with me. You know what, John? Everyone wanted to network with me. Everyone wanted to come and talk to me. The girls wanted to come talk to me. Guys wanted to come talk to me. So I was like, wait a second. Maybe this pre-selection thing isn't just a cheat code with dating. Maybe it's also a cheat code when it comes to high status networking. Mm -hmm. I show up to Dan Fleischman's Model Citizen Fund. I, I like, if I don't bring 60 girls, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. I would never show up to Dan Bilzerian's party without 60 girls. I would be embarrassed to do so. And the guys in my program, they feel the same way. They're like, hey, Michael, what happens if you're like supposed to go to a party and you don't bring any girls? It's like, I wouldn't go. Why would I ever go to a party that I didn't bring 60 girls to? That's The party's awesome because I'm there. The best team in the NBA is the one where prime LeBron was on it. Mm -hmm. The best party in the city is the one that I'm going to. That's the way I would look at it. So I, I started looking at all these different things. So now here, here we were using pre-selection in order for like intersexual dynamics with men and women in dating. Then we started using it for networking. That's pretty cool. How crazy is that? And then here's the third thing that was crazy. When it came to sales and marketing, it was the same exact formula. It was the same exact formula when it came to like not needing it too much, uh, absolute certainty. Sure. Absolute certainty is something that uh, Jordan Belfort teaches chapter seven of his book, w uh, Way of the Wolf. And absolute certainty is a great way to talk to a woman sometimes when you're on a date. Like it's so funny, like at the highest level, you started seeing marketing, networking, uh, uh, marketing, networking, and dating were all you're doing the same things because it's like goal oriented or persuasive level mm -hmm. of communication. And so I'm like, man, this all this crazy stuff, there must be science to back this up. And so we found scientific studies to back up some of these things. Dr. David Buss's 37 culture of like, uh, he, he looks at 37 different cultures and he finds, for instance, this, this stuff is going to be obvious to you, but like in every culture, men are more interested in casual sex than women. In every culture, women tend to want men the same height or, or taller than them. In every culture, women are more interested in men procuring resources. In every culture, men are more concerned with a woman's body count than the other way around. In every culture, men are more concerned with hip to waist ratio, signs of youth and facial symmetry than than men are than women are towards men. And so you find out these things are not cultural, they're actually genetic. And so we just take all the science, we put it into this program. I've had 800 guys go through the program right now, just almost 100% satisfaction. The guys come out of there knowing a very fundamental understanding of how to network, how to be a leader. Remember all the stuff I learned from the U.S. military? I make, I, I make them go through like a Marine Corps, U.S. military, U.S. Air Force protocol of books that they have to read about leadership. Mm -hmm. You guys, you want to know the number, if you want to date- What's the, the number one book in that, in that protocol? Uh, to me, I like- either Can't Hurt Me or uh, Extreme Ownership. Those are my two favorite. Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Goggins or Extreme. Can't Hurt Me is more of a motivation, but sure. it's not motivation, uh, like it's obsession book. Extreme Ownership is one of the greatest books ever written, okay? And then the other, the third one is Gates of Fire. That one is incredible. It's about the Battle of Thermopylae between uh, King Leonidas and, and uh, King Xerxes. That is 
That is a great book. And the thing, the reason why people don't grasp what I'm saying is- I've read that book. I'll put it down. It's fantastic. It's required reading for the U.S. Marine Corps. And so what happens is- uh, you know, you, you, you do all these things and you start using the, you start looking for scientific proof and you start looking for experience and you start to see that all these people are doing like you. So again, networking, it works like this. And then we look at marketing and then we look at sales and we look at dating and we say, okay, these are very, very common things that are working. And then you start saying, well, anything that exists that's pervasive amongst homo sapiens has to exist somewhere in evolution. Remember we're studying evolutionary psychology. And so when you go back and you look at that, you start to wonder like, what was it that our ancestors needed these things for? And that's where I came like with a later theory for me, which is the concept that the ultimate goal or the highest, the apex for the performance of mankind is men accomplishing goals together. Does that make sense? Sure. Us working together to do this podcast or build a skyscraper or put a man on the moon or whatever. Those are the things men working in, in concert with each other for a military engagement or to build a car or whatever. I think that is the apex of the, of the human experience is for humans to do that. And then along with having a family, I think that's the other part of the apex experience. But those things, mm -hmm. it's like, because why? Because that's what our ancestors did in order to survive. There's a reason Hobo Habil Homo habilis, Homo australis, Homo neanderthalis, there's a reason why they don't exist and we do it's because we as homo sapiens figured out how to work in groups in order to accomplish goals and so then that that became part of my program too so it's leadership well, yeah, it's teamwork sure. I, it's networking it's dating it's all those the, kind of the, things the tribe mentality is is so important in all aspects of not just society but even business if you look at if you look at like traction which is the eos system which we've run all our businesses on yeah the big founding principle of the eos system is that everybody in the company understands the goals everybody is yes. yeah. the same way so mm -hmm. it's it's that shared accomplishment that you have within that tribe mentality that's important. So I see that. Oh, know, but, I, but, but here's the other thing. If you ahead. want 70 or 80 girls to show up to somewhere, it's the same actual, it's actually the same thing. Like, what? it's funny. I was a captain on my football team and I was, uh, you know, like a sometime mission commander on a, on a, a mission. And then I was also the, I, I host, I didn't mention this before. I've hosted about 50 bikini competitions so far. I host the three biggest ones in Las Vegas and I host the three biggest in the world, which is Wet Republic's um, Girls of Summer, the Paradise Challenge in Jamaica, and then the Swimsuit USA's World Championship in Cancun. Those are the three yeah. biggest bikini competitions in the world. So I host all, th I'm the, I'm the You're MC. You're like the Ryan thing. Seacrest of <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> but, but you want to know something? When I talk to the other defensive linemen, and I try to hype them up before we went to uh, out, out to play football. Mm. It's the same voice, tenor, and pitch. It, like Ray Lewis right before the game starts. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? No tool shall be formed against us. And he's like pushing guys. It was the same thing when I talked to the girls at the beginning competition. And they loved it. And the, and the crazy thing is the people who were organizing the competition were like, I understand why he's different. And the girls never questioned anything I did. They showed up on stage. They were always on time. And it was really one of these things where I didn't treat them like kids. I treated them like fucking military, like NCOs. Well, yeah, because you just said something I think is important. Because yeah. you said the reason you've had success in that arena with those things or the reason the promoters come back to you is because they see that you're unique. Yeah. How do you form uniqueness of individuals when they're running through your programs. How do you like, for example, like I just, it's so funny. I'm not comparing you to this, but yeah. it's just the thought that I had when you were coming on, which is uh, Neil Strauss's book, the game about that lunatic guy, mystery. Oh, I'm interviewing mystery in like three weeks. Awesome. There yeah. you go. So, so, but if, but if you remember, he had that show on VH one, which was sure. like super fucking captivating. Yeah. Like it was just fascinating. Cosmo to watch. who the guy who won the first season, he comes here all the time. Okay, I talked cool. to him about a month ago. Yeah. But it was just fascinating to yeah. watch that. Right. But it seemed to me that in, through that program of what they were trying to do, he was trying to spin off like clones and you just said how important it is yes. to, to, to be unique and have individuality. Yeah. So how do you continue to establish that through what you do through teaching these guys the skills, but finding their own way to get do you, there? Do you understand? Like, so the top, like 17% of the male population makes more than a hundred thousand dollars a year. I love this. I love when you did this to this girl yeah. on your podcast. Yeah. I saw this. The top 1% is I think 640,000, <laughs> somewhere between 540 and 600,000, I think uh, is the top 1% of, of wage earners. I think being successful makes you unique because very few people are number one. And I also think that no, as a man, not doing the, like either, like either men are too much or too little. They're too meek and they get put in the friend zone or they're creepy as fuck. And, <laughs> 
there's this there's this thing where it's like you clearly and totally understand how to communicate with women and understate female nature without being more female like. Yeah. Meaning you may like I you know what I do with my girlfriend yesterday? We watch football. We watch a ton of I watch highlights. Me and my, all, wife, me and my wife watch football yeah, every single because yeah. I still maintain boundaries of masculinity, even though I understand how to speak to a woman. That to me is like the that's the ultimate form. So like kind of understanding that. If you were a man and did that, you are unique. So few men know that. And John, it's getting worse because of social media. You worked for Hooters of America. You were around women. You were within four feet of them, having conversations with them. After a while of seeing really nice boobs, you get used to it and it doesn't affect you anymore after the hundred or 500th time. The men today don't do that. They see doctored photographs on social media that make them believe that all women look like this. Huh. And then they get their dopamine hits through pornography that they can get unlimited amounts of for free and women contra uh the, the you know the other side for women is the concept that they can go on dating apps and left swipe six thousand times for every one right swipe for every date they go on they'll left swipe six thousand times number? women are going on dating apps right now and Ooh, have no intention close. of dating they just get tons of attention and the women start getting this idea that every time i left swipe on a guy i'm better than him and he the, she also assumes that if i wanted to i could make that guy i just left swiped commit to me and have a monogamous relationship with me which of course you and I know is absurd. Yes. All those dudes on that dating app are looking for short term sexual yeah. access to you. And so, and, and if you're a man and you go on one of those dating platforms, it's six guys to every girl. And every time you see a woman who's attractive, she's either a prostitute, she's trying to sell, she's trying to get you down her OnlyFans funnel, or she has some sort of mental disorder. And oh. that's like essentially what you're dealing with. And that's why, like, these things are have become so pervasive where men are delusional when it comes to OnlyFans, pornography, and then how they, how they view women. And women are like, massively delusional when it comes to this concept of like, they think the I average man makes a hundred thousand dollars a year. So they think much. the average man is a six feet tall. No, no. Cause you, cause you said on your, you said, you said, uh, you, you had a, you had a group of girls on this podcast, which yeah. you should check out. It's yeah. pretty cool. And, uh, in a group of girls and he said, what's your ideal guy? These were younger. These were younger women. Yeah. And they were like, you know, six, four makes over a hundred thousand dollars a year, blah, blah, blah. Six, and then give them the stats you gave. Them yeah. So, so six foot three, you're in the <laughs> top 1% of, of height. Like six foot three, okay? So $100,000 a year, that's the top 17%. So ladies who are watching this, it's not 17% plus 1%. No. It's 17% times 1%. Yeah. That's how you get the six four guy who makes $100,000 a year. Yeah. Now, if you want the six four guy who's a male stripper, he's not making $100,000 a year. Most no. of them aren't, sorry. And and if they do make $100,000 a year, it's because they're gay for pay. Like it's it's great, <laughs> but but like but he's six four and handsome, so you kind of got what you wanted. And then if you want the guy who makes 500,000, like, Girls don't understand, like when you see a Lambo, like just say a Lambo, let's just say we're 260 to 400K, whatever, sure. wh whatever you're going, that needs to be, unless this guy's a complete moron or he's selling crack, he needs to, he needs to, that needs to not be more than what? 10% of his net worth. Oh, dude, bro, no. if you if you're buying a Lambo and it's 50% you of your net worth. cash for it twice, don't. Bro, if you if you're the buying a Lambo and, and by the way, most of the guys aren't, but if you They're, buy a yeah. Lambo and it's more than 10 7% of your net worth, you're a fucking moron. Like yeah. for doing that's crazy. Like and, and by the way, let me tell you something else. If you buy a Lambo, the only reason why I would ever do it is for content. If I was using it for content and I could write off depreciation on the Lamborghini, I would make it part I'd make my LLC own that Lamborghini. I would write off everything on that fucking thing that then I would own a Lambo. Then I would do it. Okay. And then I'd probably lease it and trade it in for another one. Like a couple years later, I would make it work for me smart. That's like listen game. to Ryan Stuman. He's so great when he That's talks about game. this stuff. Ryan Stuman is so smart when it comes to this Stuman. stuff. Yeah. Um, and so, so like, that's, that's why you would do that. So, you know, I forgot what the original point was, where we were going. I got off on the line. Oh, dude, I, we're talking, I don't know. We're just talking random stuff. <laughs> the, the point I was going to make was you, you were going so fast at it, which is how grateful I am that none of those dating apps and shit oh, yeah, yeah, existed yeah, yeah, when yeah, I was yeah, single. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, none of that, none of that, dude, when, when I met my wife, yes. bro, when I met my wife, we were on MySpace and I would hit her up on AOL Instant yeah, Messenger. Yeah, that's the way it works. That's so, where we were at. I remember what I was talking about before. <laughs> so it's 17% times 1% if you want 6'4 and makes 100 yeah, yeah. a year. And so, and then, but here's, a, here's the other part. The girls are like, no, but I've dated guys like that. And I always ask him, but did you lock him down? He goes, yeah, but we were engaged. Yeah. But did he marry you? Yeah. Did he cheat? Was he talking to other girls? He's like, yeah, but he was going to marry me. And I'm like, but he, did he marry you? And like, whenever you talk to a girl who's been engaged five times, you ever met some of those girls Dude, who's super I got, pretty? I, I got, I got a couple of them in my circle. Yeah. They've been engaged five times and they like think it's normal and they don't 
recognize what you and I clearly know, which is no, these guys wanted short term sexual access, but the girl was really attractive. And so they were going to say or do anything they mm -hmm. could in order to get married, but they were never going to marry these girls. And like it takes until the women are like in their mid 30s or 40s before they come to that realization. Let's, okay, let's flip this for a second, yeah. right? Because at this point, it's been all about dude power, right? Let's talk about that, man. Because yeah. like one of the things I'll tell you about Las Vegas that, you know, me and my wife talk about a lot yeah. is it's like, if you're in Vegas is like a vacuum, like you got to go, like if you're, if you're a woman in this town, yeah. this is coming from my, don't call me, don't call me a sexist people. Don't save your, yeah. save your shitty comments. This is my wife says this stuff. But if you're, if you're in Vegas, if you don't wrap a dude down pretty quick, that's in that upper echelon, you're going to age out quick. Yeah. I mean, it, I actually like, cause, think cause, I, th th cause a lot of these girls are like, oh, I want this guy that makes all this money, blah, 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 yeah. blah. Yeah. But now he's, he's got Peter Pan syndrome and he's skipped down. Bro. He's after the 24 year old. He's not after the 34 year old. Yeah. Th it's, it's, it's not fair here. No here. It's like, I do nothing. And I was dating hotter girls than I'd ever dating, you yeah. know, whatever, going to a club on stage and whatever happens partying with the hotter girls than I'd ever been with in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And it was, there were so many more women than men here. It's like, it's the opposite. The dating app is six times as many dudes as women. It like, like yeah. nightlife industry in Vegas, it's six times as many women as yeah, men. It's hard. So it's just so easy. And like, it was one of these, so going back to what you're saying, but what we were talking about before, these women would find out that it was like one, you know, like six tenths of 1% of men met their criteria for six, three and a hundred K. And then we would look at the women. And of course, as men, we do not care about income or height. That's really big because we don't care about income and we don't care about height. No. So it was 14% of the female population versus 0.6% of the male yeah. population. And these women that they, they were going to lock these dudes down and to go back to what you said in LA, I think it's different. I actually like in LA women uh, get treated pretty well and dudes get treated like trash in Vegas. It's the opposite. Men get treated very well here. If you're a local and you go out on a regular basis, oh, yeah. like you get comps all the time. It's like women actually get treated kind of like cattle here. And then especially like in a couple of weeks, we've got the, um, the tryouts for all the nightlife groups, 8,000 girls are going to show up for realistically, realistically, I'm not even kidding here. There will be 60, maybe 50 new cocktail servers hired in the entire city. And I'm talking about of the top pools. Yeah. Oh yeah. Each pool has 40 girls and most of the girls get called back. So a pool, an individual pool might hire anywhere from like seven to two girls per year. And so you add up all the pools and then the pools kind of like sometimes feed into the nightclubs. We're talking about less than 60 yeah. girls. 8,000 girls will show up, 60 will get hired. For those of you listening to us from places it's easier not to get Las into, Vegas. Yeah, yeah, it's easier to get in, I, I saw a study, it's easier to get into Yale or Harvard than it is to become a top tier bottle service girl in, in Las Vegas. Because those girls, in case you're just wondering, make a quarter of a million bucks a yes, year. Yes, so 250, 260 is not and work, uncommon. And work how many days a week? Three yeah, days four, a week, four, four days a week? They work four days a week, and, and then if you work at the pool, you make more per shift, but you only work eight months. Yeah, my, my wife, when we got together, worked at the Palm. She she opened the palms mm -hmm. and she had the main blackjack pit from noon to eight, Monday through Friday. That was yep. she like a banker's hour shifts. She made a quarter of a million dollars and, and normally only worked three, maybe four days. Which yeah, early she's not days. walking around in a bikini at a pool. No, she's working, doing like gambling. That's, I mean, you understand, no, 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 but still, I mean, no, she's still at her ass hanging out. Yeah. I mean, that's what cocktail, but, but, but the thing outfit, that, like this a gladiator outfit, whenever it was the other thing that makes the city really crazy is that not only are there just so many more women than men, I just, I cannot fathom how any single man watching this doesn't live in Vegas. I literally cannot. <laughs> not <laughs> fathom how you live anywhere else. I just I, don't understand. But anyway, going back to what I was saying, yeah. um, the other thing that makes this city so disproportionate is the average man's job here, whether it be construction, VIP host, works and services, he's going to make somewhere between 60 and 100K. And the women that are the the commiserate women are making 200K Way working as a rhino. They're either a cocktail server, an, uh, you know, a dancer. They work in, in gambling or you know, uh, they're a female bartender, they're making 200K. So a lot mm -hmm. of times you'll have a woman who's making 240 a year dating a busser who's making 60. She's he's she's making four X. But this his is, band's gonna take off any day, yeah, Michael. Exactly. Any day. Yeah, his, get only fan, his only fans management any agency. Day. This is gonna be the idea. Any his new, day. Did you hear about his new NFT, John? This Dude, is the way this, this NFT is the one. His Call of Duty team's gonna get yes, the call for of sure. His esports e team. <laughs> it's it's always like that. It's like it's a, yeah. it's a very funny. You ever have a former cocktail server on here? Ask her about the trope of the cocktail server who makes 240 a year, leaving her fucking plastic surgeon boyfriend to date the busser. I don't know how, but it keeps 
keeps happening over and over again. It's just so <sighs> funny that it's just one of the tropes that happens here. But it's just like there's a mismatch that goes back. Remember the original thing we talked about. So, well, so but here's the problem though. How long, how long? Okay, look, because if you're that type of financial disparity between the man and the woman, uh -huh. I, look, I, I may look, I, I'm all about whoever wants to bring money to the house, God bless, bring it. Agreed. In. But I also think that it it screws up the dichotomy of the relationship. I think if sure. you're the man, I think it's got to burn you a little. Like, I, I just, I can never imagine just like chilling at home and what having. It, what does it say in the Bible? It's like, it, it is better to be a non-believer than to not be able to provide for your family. Yeah, dude. It seems like they had that figured out 3,000 years ago. Yeah, I, I, so, so, I, re yeah. I retired my wife 11 years ago. There you go. You there know you what go. I mean? I, it's, I just can't even imagine. So it's one of these situations where it, it's absolutely, I encourage if women want to work, that's fine. What they find is that in the workforce, I don't know if you've seen this study, 83% of women said that they, if they had the opportunity to be a stay at home mother, yes. they would have chosen 83%. Take that feminists. Yeah. How you like that one? Yeah, exactly. How does that one taste? And, and that's what, and that's what me and my wife did. Cause yeah. it was important to both of us that we, we, you know, I call it the peanut butter and jelly mom. When yeah. I was growing up, like my, my mom worked and you know, my parents were split up, but you know, you had that one house in the neighborhood where there was like that one mom that would make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for all the kids while yeah. they were playing football in the front yard. That's what we wanted my wife to be. And that's what she wanted to do. For sure. So it's been great for my kids. For sure. Super for sure. And I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, but so you have that, you have that opportunity for some women to want to go do that. What mm -hmm. they found, and this was first presented to me by Rolo Tomasi. He's one of my best friends. He's uh he's my co-host partner on Access Vegas. Uh, Rolo was saying something to the effect of the, one of the number one precipitators of divorce is when a woman starts making more money than a man. And so you're thinking about like, she gets promoted at her, at her law firm and she makes more money than him. Yeah. That is a precipitator. But what, what he actually really means is the man loses his job. And so now she makes any money, even if she's a bus driver, she makes more money than he does. And so that's gen generally the precipitator of divorce. When you ask women, did you leave your man because he didn't have any money? They never say of that's the not. reason. They say, ready for it? We grew apart. Part. Yeah, financially. We grew <laughs> apart. That's essentially what they said. Because, because that's the thing. Like As men, we have to be open and honest about why we had to fire. We have a thing called fired with cause, right? We, if we fire someone for no reason, they can sue us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, right? So we understand as men, for us to terminate a relationship, we need a clear understanding, a legal understanding. Women don't need that. Women just break up in relationships and say, we grew apart. Or they say he wasn't ambitious enough. No, he got fat and he didn't have a nice job. And you worked in a place where you were surrounded by men who were better looking, taller, and made more money. And you got tired of the shit he was saying. So you fucking monkey branch to another <laughs> dude and that's fine but for some reason women won't admit that that's what they're doing and that's fine that you're doing that evolution made it that way men want look at lo numbers of uh attractive young women and they want to have sex with all those young women and if they had the ability to they'd all end up becoming damn Blazarian. not all of them but a lot of them would become like some like something like that uh, there, there's another study where it's like the number of men who wish they had more sexual partners was like outrageously high. So there's a, a group of men that have a ton of sexual partners. And then there's a group of men below them that don't, but wish they did. Yeah. Right. For women, they ask, do you wish you had more sexual partners? And of course, most women say, no, they don't wish they had more sexual partners. Right. It's much, much but, less. Okay. But do they mean that? Or do they, they just don't want to tell, they don't want to vocalize that because yeah. they get slut shamed. For yeah, well, so, so the thing is, when men are definitely more interested in casual sex than women and they've done studies. So like one of the best studies I've ever seen is look at gay men in the Castro. There were men at that out there that were averaging 300 different partners per year averaging Jeez. so like when you want to look at the male libido completely unchecked it looks like 300 partners a year i don't care i know girls who do porn and i know girls who escort and none of them want 300 partners in a year none of them at most they want four maybe three and they want the guys to be really good looking and then on top of that you know what else they want they want attention from a hundred other men who they aren't sleeping with that's what women women generally want that it just doesn't women because of you know oxytocin release they generally are not as interested in, in casual sex. There's also a thing in evolutionary psychology called parental investment hypothesis, which is the concept which which either uh, which either one of the genders is more invested in raising the children, that gender is going to be the more selective. So there's a certain type of fish where the male fish hold the eggs and they and the females fight for the male fish. There's also seahorses where this happens, mm -hmm. but in most of them, it's obviously men competing with other men for women. And then you can tell the level of 
competition by the dimorphic difference between the two genders. So an elephant bull seals will com literally murder, homicide one another in order to have access to all the females. And the male elephant bull seals are 10 times larger than the females. Same thing with gorillas. Gorillas are about six times, the males are six times bigger than the females. With homo sapiens, we're about one, we're about 15, men are about 15% bigger than the women. On average, we are. Um, uh, and so because of that, what that means is for the most part, we competed, but not to the same level that gorillas did. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so you find out all this kind of stuff. You look at your evolution. You can see almost like how the programming worked. And there's so many incredible answers, John, when you well, actually study uh, evolutionary psychology. There's so many answers to so many questions that we had. Does body count matter? Yes, we well, know now that it well, matters. Well, hang on a second. Let, I want to talk yeah. about this because there's evolutionary stuff that's built into us. But yeah. obviously, with your program teaching guys, yeah. one of the things that I found back in the day when I actually did have more game than Parker Brothers, which yeah. was a long time ago. Now I'd be, dude, if, if my wife left me tomorrow, I'd be like fucking, I'd be like, uh, what's his name? I'd be like Ricky Bobby. Like, I don't know what to do with my hands. I don't like, know what I to do. What do I do? Be, it's been, yeah, I'd be so confused, but I'd be like the cat, the inside cat that got out. That's what I'd yeah, be Yeah, like. and they're like, I don't know what to do. Yeah, exactly. That happens with my cats. Like, yeah. Right. So, but I always found back way, in the day. Just, just to go back to your point, about a quarter of the guys in my program are what you are just described. Right. Yeah, they've gone through a divorce and That's then they, it. Yeah. And they don't know, they, they're like this, they don't do their hands. Yeah. But so I always, I always found back in the day, my best way to compete was not to compete. Yeah. As a matter go. of fact, when I met my wife, I was out here visiting her. I was staying with her. And we were at, uh, oh, shoot, what was the uh, 40 deuce? We were 40 deuce at Mandalay Bay. Okay. That's like how long ago that was. And uh, she started talking to this guy that was obviously just her friend, but just like talking to him for too long. So I just left. Yes. <laughs> I just, I not pouting, not anything else. I just left. And she's like, where are you? I'm like, I went to gamble. She's yeah. like, what? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll see you later. I, I like also the concept of having a ton of female friends because you get to see, you get to look behind the veil. Sure. And like, they'll literally show you, uh, the, the, you'll see the nice text messages between them and a guy and then they'll text some other guy. But like, like when you see it, when you really see it, if you guys, I'm telling you, have a female friend who's like a complete slut and like just watch how she behaves and it will just <laughs> It'll illu scar you it will for illuminate women. so much. Like you will be so or, ru or ruin your whole concept of the yes. life. But like you will it would literally just consider Keanu Reeves like taking the thing out of his head and in, in the Matrix and he's like, what is this? Like that's the level of just like disillusionment. I know, slut foo. You will understand. <laughs> anyway, so so you if you have a female friend like that, you'll start to see like what actually is going on. And it's so terrific uh when you see stuff like that. And I remember one time I had a friend of mine named, named Kim. And Kim was like that. She was very much like to test men, have several of them running at the same time. So Kim was not a good investment opportunity for me. So I was like, okay, Kim's a good friend. And then also Kim had a bunch of super hot friends. So I was like, okay, Kim is a wing, great friend. wing girl, good friend. Okay. So one time me and Kim went to anybody from Dallas, you know about Sfoozies. Sfoozies used to be this huge, it's, it's still there now, but it's used to be the it place. Everyone went to Sfoozies. This is back like 2011, whatever. Kim legitimately had five guys that she met on dating apps, come meet her at Foozies at the same time. And I'm like, I'm going to sit back and watch this five dudes show up. They're all competing for attention. There was one guy at the end of the bar named John. And I remember John was like, all right, cool. John got up and left. And she started dating John and got engaged to John. Yeah. Because John didn't play the I'm game. Playing the game. The best way when you're dealing with a game that not just a woman, but anyone puts you into is to not to play the game, to not adhere to the boundaries that they're trying to, to, to enforce on you. And when you do that, that just shows a higher level of status. But I think even more, it's to act, it's to just not care. Sure, not sure. The game. Now, there's a difference between not caring and then like levels of. So there's there's some studies that show that uh, women are tra attracted to uh, what are what are called dark triad traits, which is Machiavellianism, yeah, sociopathy, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and narcissism. There's a test for that. Yeah. yeah. So what what you'll find is. Women are mostly attracted to narcissism traits. They're not attracted as much to sociopathy traits, um, and so. What, what, you'll, what you'll find is that what you just described, having boundaries, a lot of men see other men with boundaries and confuse the, again, I'm having a conversation with a girl. She tells me, I can't believe my boyfriend, he's a fucking asshole. He's such a narcissist, she'll throw that word out. And I'm like, I'm always kind of curious. So sometimes I'll go meet the guy and I'll talk to him and he'll be like, yeah, from the day one, I told her I wasn't gonna be in a relationship with her. Uh, I told her I was gonna see other people. I, you know, I hang out with her sometimes, we have great sex, it's really cool, but I told her if she wants to see other people, she can. And I'm like, that dude's not a narcissist. He just had boundaries. Yeah, just that dude's not mean at all. Like I can't blame him for anything. Mm -hmm. And she keeps going back to him and then blaming him for it. And I just remember like watch, like seeing this happening over and over again and came to the realization, you don't have to be a narcissist. 
What you have to do though is maintain masculine boundaries. And if you do that, that's fine. And your boundaries are up to you. You remember the whole Jonah Hill nonsense, right? Jonah Hill did nothing wrong. I'm gonna say this again. Jonah Hill did nothing wrong. If anybody wants to debate me on this, you want to come on my show and get embarrassed. <laughs> Jonah Hill did nothing wrong. <laughs> Jonah the Hill, thoughts and feelings. Jo of Jonah Hill do not reflect. No, I'm just kidding. No, fine. <laughs> Jonah Hill literally tells his girl, this is why he did nothing wrong. He yeah. says, I would prefer if you didn't do this, didn't do this, didn't do this. Doesn't yeah. matter what he asked for. At the end, he said, I support you if this is what you need in your life. And I encourage you, you're a beautiful, successful woman, but this might not be for us. Yeah. He gave her the opportunity to leave and then he broke up with her. He, what he did was enforce boundaries. And if you want to say, well, he shouldn't be telling her to not wear a bikini, then you need to tell every Muslim, the 1 billion, 500 million Muslim men on this, uh, this country, on this planet, that they're all God. misogynists. Tell every Muslim that they're misogynists. Every Protestant that wants their wife to not walk around in a bikini. Uh, my girlfriend's a bikini competitor. I don't care that she's in a bikini, but some men have the opportunity, if they choose so, to have different boundaries in their relationship. Some guys let their wives sleep with other men, and some guys are like, I would prefer if you didn't wear that when we went out. You have the right to do that. As long as the other person has the right to leave, you're not being controlling. You have the right to do that. And there's there's just been this massive misinterpretation because here's one of the things. When you tell men that they can't have boundaries or when men do have boundaries that it's controlling, you don't allow men to lead and you don't allow men to be masculine. And they become less attractive to women. And then women complain, where are all the good men? You mm -hmm. need to allow men to lead and to act in a masculine manner. And the entire world is trying to teach men to not do that thing, to not be masculine. I, 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 are we starting to see the pendulum swing back a little bit right now? I, I'm feeling it depends like on what, like if you were on all that, of it. If, if no, you were on that no, Twitter space, no, 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 with, all of it. with Andrew Tate and Elon Musk the other day, no. with, with Alex Jones, then maybe. But yeah, like for the rest no, of the world, I don't know. Nah, dude, I'm saying because like look at Bill Ackerman right now. As is is not Ackerman. Ackerman is all over like the whole Harvard and, and Penn deal and all of that. I think, I think the pendulum of sanity can, is starting can, can, to swing can back you, Can you bit. give like some, some context, the Harvard and Penn thing? I thought that yes. was about the Israel thing. No, it, it was, it was, but, yeah. but see, here's the problem. I, I look at, and this was one of the smartest things that I've seen anybody say in a long time. And Jordan Peterson said this mm -hmm. and, and he said it on Bill Maher's show. And what he said was the problem in a nutshell, I'm going to paraphrase him, but he said the problem currently with our society, especially in universities, is everything, the kids are taught at a young age to view everything through a Marxist lens, meaning, yes. meaning this, that there has to be power and powerless in every situation. Yes. There has the, to be an aggressor and, and, and a victim and in the power, every situation. And the, the powered must be evil. Yes, must be evil. By, like, well, for instance, there's the- The, the just the, is the capital, always the side of the week. The, 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 the description from Marx's, uh, the, the, the um, Communist Manifesto, there is the capital class and then there's the proletariat. Yes. And the capital class is evil and cannot yes. help but to be evil and knows nothing but evil and can do nothing else but evil. And the proletariat is always innocent. Yes. You're correct. And in, in doing so, there is no other way to define economies other than to do that. Another way to but say I, but it. I, but I think part of that has become, and, and how that ties back, yes, it was about Israel, what I was talking about, yeah. with Ackerman, but what I was talking about was the, the, the patriarchy, that view that, mm -hmm. has been, that has been seated, which I think is the number one thing that has weakened men in this country, sure. is those views in, in that that idea mm. that it's wrong to be masculine. It's wrong to, to want to take charge as yes. a man in your household. Yes. So masculinity, they taught, they deem as toxic, masculinity. toxic masculinity. But, but the thing is, is, are is there, there good masculinity yeah. or is it just straight to toxic? Just, so, so here's the thing. Yeah. That's my point. That's yeah. like, like, well, the problem is masculinity has been used for several things. It was used in the 1980s. I believe there was a, it was some show, it was like a two homosexual men and they were using it to try to like talk about men who shamed other men for being gay as being toxically masculine. And then later on, psychologists used it for like violent offenders in prison, like I believe in the 1990s. But the term has a meaning, but the meaning is this, like the two things are mutually exclusive. You can be masculine or feminine and then you can be toxic or non-toxic. Mm -hmm. If you're masculine and toxic, you want to put the words together and say toxic masculinity. Technically that's a thing, but the two words do not go together in and of themselves. Sure. And people try to make it like, th like that is the case. So again, me setting boundaries for my relationship, hey, I would prefer it if you didn't wear this and didn't go out at this time. That is a masculine boundary that I'm setting, but all masculinity is now considered toxic masculinity yeah. to a certain group of, I like, I instead of Marxist, I like to say egalitarian yeah. people or progressives, uh, to them, 
all of it is toxic masculinity. They cannot come up with any term for anything that is masculine that is not toxic. And so because of that, like you're saying, it's just name calling. It's anyone who doesn't agree with you on race politics is a racist. And any man who doesn't sure. agree with a woman on anything is icky or creepy. It's one of these situations where it's a name that I can now call you to sort of try to defeat. It's, it's very, what was the, um, uh, anytime two people are arguing and the first person to invoke Hitler or the Nazis lost the argument. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, any, <laughs> no, the first, but you're right. Yeah, the first person, because you had to go to the extreme. Yeah. It's the same type of situation. I know whenever you say that what I'm saying is toxically masculine, I know, and deep down, that's you know, you've lost the, but you've lost the argument. Because you got nowhere to go. You've you got that. nowhere to go. So essentially that's, that's the way it works. Now, are men, men who beat their wives toxically masculine? They are toxic. I know homosexual men who've beaten their boyfriends. Yeah. So there are feminine men who have acted toxic, have acted toxic. So those things are mutually exclusive. That's always the point that I've tried sure. to make and trying to put them together is so damaging to men. And that's the thing. Uh, one of the things is I, I've dealt, there's a, a group of evolutionary psychologists or they're, they're sex researchers. Um, and these guys are progressives and, um, they, they don't like this, this terminology of like, say women are delusional. If I say men are delusional, it's fine. If I say women are delusional, then it's a problem. And the reason why is because in academia, which tends to lean more progressive, men are a privileged class and women are a protected class. Yeah. And so it, it doesn't make any difference. Do men suffer? Like if you were to do a, like I could show, um, there's statistics that show that as men are zeroed out, uh, financially after over the age of 40 and they're divorced, the likelihood of them taking their own lives is nine X. Oh, nine times higher. Okay. So if I were to do a, let's say I would do a college course, why men suffer or like something like this. And yeah. I would go over men die from industrial accidents more. They're 80% of the victims of violent crime. <laughs> and they're nine times as likely to take their own lives after they've been divorced. If I were to do this and also they 20% of divorces are initiated by men, 80% are initiated by women. Yeah. If I were to say 97% of alimony is paid from men to women, all these different types of things. And I did a, a, a course at Harvard called why men, why are men suffering? Oh God. We would have people boycotting yeah. the even like, how dare you even pretend as if men yeah. suffer ever for any reason. And the thing is, do, is it definitely hard for women? It certainly is. And there's plenty of, of, of ways we can look at, I, I certainly, I, this is, I go very much against the red pill, um, community on this. I do think sexual assault is underreported. I think I, mm -hmm. because I lived here for a long time and I've seen girls be sexually assaulted and the police don't take them seriously. Yeah. I think it's massively underreported. Uh, whereas a lot of guys in this space think it's overreported. Uh, I no, don't I'll, think it I'll is. Agree, I'll agree with you yeah. on that. Um, and uh, do, by the way, but here's the problem because about 5% of women, about 6% of women who have borderline personality disorder. Those are the women who tend to falsely report sexual assault, the Amber Heard type of individual, yeah. they falsely report it. And because of them, they make it harder for everyone else. The the whole situation with, uh, I believe her name was Nikki Hill or something Hill, the woman who accused Trevor Bauer of uh, of abusing her. Turns out none of it was true. He's a he's a, a catch or he's a pitcher for the the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. Couldn't play for two years. Turns out everything she said wasn't true. He was totally acquitted of this. And my whole thing is. While that makes a lot of men angry to see a woman falsely accusing men of sexual assault, it should make women angry. Is someone sure if you're an advocate of a sexual of a of a domestic abuse clinic and you see women falsely reporting sexual assault, you understand they've degraded your ability to do work. Yeah. Women should be more mad at the Trevor Bauer and uh, more mad at the Johnny Depp situation. Women should be more upset than men are, but men are the ones who are more I, upset. I, I, I don't know. I think a lot of women were upset by that. I think, I, I think they saw the value in that. This is such a high profile deal. Like if it ever happened, how it's going to damage my ability. Correct. To be, to, I, I just don't ability. think the outrage was nearly enough from the women's side as it was for men. Yeah. Men were like, this woman should go to jail. And women were like, you know, they all of a sudden they just kind of like deleted their previous tweets. Yeah. Like that's all I saw from them. Right. Yeah. That one didn't age that well, did it? Right. No, it didn't. So, so that's the thing. Like, I really do think we should hold everyone to account. Every news media organization that said Trevor Bauer was guilty, or I think we should hold the Dodgers, the Dodgers to account for well, suspending I, him. If you're going to talk about sports and that, I think you're like the, the Duke lacrosse deal. Man. Of course, that, Duke that lacrosse was, is, a, is another extreme worst. example. Just so we're clear, we're yeah, talking, most women would never do that. We're talking about less than 5% of women. Yeah. There's also the defensive tackle at Baylor who lost his, he wasn't drafted in the NFL because of a false allegation. Yeah. The punter for, I forgot if it's the Chargers or the Bills. He 
ended up like uh, uh, almost doing like life in prison for something that turns out they found out through phone records. He wasn't even in the same zip code as where the, the uh, accused oh, uh, wow. action was. And the, the county sheriff like uh, uh, quitted him or something, something to that effect. When we see situations like this, I'm, we're talking about maybe five or 6% of women who do this. But the, the problem is it's so damaging for the women who are legitimately claiming sexual assault when these women are up here doing this falsely and crying wolf. It makes it harder for everyone. Yep. And so that's that's essentially the problem. But I'm not the one who should be saying this. It should be women on here saying this. Yep. Ladies, when you falsely accuse someone of this crime, you're not just hurting yourself and not, you're not just destroying that man's reputation. You're destroying the entire movement when well, you let's, do that. Well, let's, let's shift off to talk about something yeah. a little lighter as we're coming to the end of our time yeah. here. But uh, I, I want to talk about this because something we haven't talked about yet, which I think is great because it is the season for charitable contributions and giving back. But you have really taken your system for building a great social circle and adapted it into a charitable angle. And I love this. So let's yeah. talk about that. Yeah. So, so it's one of these things where I started uh, getting involved with these influencer charities. So we would invite girls with large social media followings mm -hmm. and we get them to use their platforms in order to get more people to come and donate either money or toys. Like if it was a toy drive or if we did an animal rescue supplies for animals. And it got to the point where we did so many of them. And I'm referring to Babes in Toyland, the Teatro Parties, the Model Citizen Fund, which is Dan Fleischman's mm -hmm. uh, event. All these things that were charitable, even Paradise Challenge in Jamaica, they help uh, raise money for a school that's out there. Uh, in all these different places, uh, they're helping raising m money for charities and they're using, so So, if you ever met like a, a, a very famous, you know, a, a very famous model, let's just say you met like a Lindsay Palace or an Emily Sears or something like that. If you were to meet them, it would, it, for them to help promote a charity is very easy for them because they have a lot of eyeballs that are on them. Sure. Kindly Myers, yeah. CJ Sparks, someone like that. They have a lot of eyeballs on them and they can help that charity very easily with very little work. They have what's what I would consider a superpower. So we we came to the idea of like, let's have these ladies use their superpower in order to for good. And there's men with large followings that can do this too. Uh, Dan Bilzerian, he, you know, I think he brings a lot of awareness to men who are amputees. He talks about it in his book, he would take groups of amputees that were military amputees and he would try, he would take them out on these incredible like field trips and go shooting and do all kinds of fun mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I think we should bring awareness to these things and having a large social media following allows you to be able to do that. So that's a superpower. But the thing is we did so many of these that I started noticing that my entire friend group all the people I did business with and all the girls that I would date were people that came to these events with me, these charity events. Yeah. And my life was just better. I was just around people who were smarter, wealthier, more successful, more honest, prettier, more like, like women that were prettier, women that were just more accountable. And I just found like, this is a better way to live my life rather than going to a nightclub and just like doing yeah, bottle like, service. for you know, and, 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 but, but you're like bottle service and you're just watching dudes like try to force feed girls cocaine and go to the fucking after hours. And like, that's how they were trying to get laid. And I was like, I uh, it's, you know, I like seeing some of those DJs live. I really do enjoy nightclubs. I, I'm one of the few guys in my 40s. I really still like going to nightclubs. But I also like realized that these charity events were just so much more productive. They were quieter. And like I, I met so many people that ended up in couples that ended up getting in relationships from going to these charity galas as opposed to like a nightclub. Yeah. And so I just started to kind of teach my guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to find all the charities in our cities and we're going to support them. We're going to support them through social media. We're going to support them with our resources and we're going to support them by inviting a bunch of influencers to those charity events. Yep. Love that. And that, that's part of the, the very beginning of the first 15% of men of action. That's what I teach you is how to to do that. And then eventually you throw your own events. I don't recommend anybody throw their own events until after the first six months. Uh, but I, I go over set, step by step how to do that. Uh, it's phase, uh, phase seven in my course is called event planning. And we go over that and we go over invites and how to do different things as far as getting groups of people there. The other thing that I'm a really big proponent of is ratio. If we were going to a real estate event and we have two to go through, it's like a real estate conference here. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to the, like, without even thinking about it, John, we're going to go to the one where there's just more girls. We just are. If we just know that so and so, like Ryan Pineda is having his real estate event and there's just like three times as many girls as guys, we're just going to go to that event. Fucking Ryan. He's, yeah. so, he's so handsome. <laughs> exactly. So, dude, I mean, it's like, come on. Literally, somebody asked me, I was, I was at ma one of my mastermind groups in, in San yeah. Diego over the weekend, and I was talking to a guy that does business with Ryan. And he asked me, he just goes, what do you think about him? And I have the same canned response from Ryan every time. Yeah. I go, I hate him. And he <laughs> goes, what? Because everybody loves him, yeah. right? And I go, what do you mean? I go, oh, he's a wonderful guy. He's just too good looking. Too good looking. <laughs> too exactly. Good. It's not fair. Yeah, not but, fair he's that good looking. But, but, <laughs> but we, don't, we don't consider ratio enough. So I started, my friend who started doing real estate events where he just made, by the way, we're not talking about hot young girls. We're talking about just having as many women as men yeah. there or more women than men. Yeah. It's, 
like parties are more fun when there's women. Well, I just I don't think anyone disagrees with yeah, that. Dude, so just have it's, more women. It, it's it's in my book that's coming out soon. I talk about seeing all the angles in one of the chapters. Yeah. And and when I was twenty, I became the manager of a bar in Tallahassee. I was a, I was a partner there and became a, a partner. And, and when I first got there, the bar was dead. These two guys brought me in to run it because they had no clue what they were doing. They had yeah. no business in a bar. And the first thing I noticed was all the girl, all the people that were working there were all these, all like girls, like hot girls. And I'm like, you know what? No, 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 no. So the first thing we did was fire all the girls. And I went around and I hired a bunch of my fraternity brothers and a bunch of really good looking dudes on Florida State campus that worked at other bars. Yeah. And guess what? The guys brought in girls who brought in guys. Yeah. Catered. And I was like, look, I'm not saying we're going to do, I'm not saying we're going to set up a sewing circle, but every business I ever have from now on that's based on hospitality will always cater to women over men. Oh man, dude. How about, how about, always. dude, have you ever seen the, 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 uh, you know, I'm friends with Demopolis, Steve Demopolis here. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the thing where his entire staff is on the billboard? And yeah, it's I've like three quarters female. Yeah. Have you seen it? I've seen like, it. Like, like he, his, if you go to Demopolis' office, it's almost all females there, mm. right? And it's not because it, it, it's just, it's just fun. Guys, masculinity with like men working with other men to accomplish goals is awesome. It's mm. really cool. But like when you want, there's a, a, the place for having a lot of women around and it's fun. Now, some men can't deal with that. Some men are just born misogynist or they've been hurt by women yeah. and they don't like this type of environment. I think part of the reason why I'm so good at my job is because I enjoy the company of women as much as I enjoy the company of yeah, men. Sure. But I still like football more than figure skating. Yeah. Right. And I still like, you know, so it's, it's a little different in that aspect. So what I continue to tell men all the time is have a large group of women that will go with you to events, but do not leave your masculine boundaries ever maintain masculine frames Instead. at all times. I don't mean like, Ooh, like big tough, like a gorilla man. I'm that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, don't let your voice crack. Don't let your voice go up an octave when you're talking to women as opposed to men. Don't let your, uh, your tonality or your, um, what is it, your body language? Don't let any of those things change. The dilation of your pupils, sweaty palms, whatever, the the tone of your speech or the subject matter that you talk about, don't let that ever change. If you're with your guy friends and you're talking about, yeah, man, I went on this date with this girl. She was super hot. That's what I talk about with my girlfriends. It should you be know, the same. It should be exactly the same. Consistently authentic. And when you do that, what happens is these women are like, wow, this guy is not giving me any preferential treatment because of my physical attractiveness. I like attention from all these other men, but his attention is worth more because I have to work harder for it. It's that simple. Yep. And by the way, it's that same way in sales. It's the same way in marketing. It's the same way with leadership. Everything. When you come to that realization, man, it's just, it really is ma magical. The only difference in dating is that there's very little logic in dating. Dating yeah. is all about emotional responses. Whereas with these other things, there's a little bit more logic involved when it comes to sales and stuff like that. Cool. Well, Michael, if they want to find you, if they want to learn more about your program, how do they find you? Dude? Listen, if you, if you like what you're hearing and you would just want to join up with us, just go to moamentoring.com. I'd recommend you go there. Uh, you can read the testimonials. I love when people come that are super scared skeptical that don't believe that I actually showed up to these events with 90 girls, a hundred girls. And at the same time, I've got these huge fortune 500 CEOs coming on my podcast. I can do both and I can teach you how to do both. Uh, if you have any skepticism, go, go check out the website, moamentoring.com. If you just want to learn more, then hit me up on Instagram. If you hit yep. me up on Instagram, and what's that? uh, it's just Michael Sartain on Instagram, Michael Sartain on it, Instagram. Or, hit me up on Instagram or just go on YouTube. Uh, and what ha will happen on Instagram? Cause you can DM me. I'm just going to give you access to our free, uh, server, our school server. And in there will be the first four steps of men of action, which is one, fix your social media two build a list three, get open threads with as many people as you can on social media. So invite, like find events to, to invite people to, mm -hmm. and Number four, take six girls with you to those events. Well, I'm going to teach you those first four steps. And once I do that, then that's kind of the gateway into the program. And then from there, we teach you all, all the other things. But that's free, and we give that yep. to you if you hit me up on Instagram. He's given you the first couple. So hit Michael up and do that. And, uh, dude, thanks for coming by. I appreciate you. I'm going to leave you guys today with this because it is the holidays, man. By the time this comes out, it'll be Tuesday, I think, next week in the middle of December. If you are listening to this right now, if you are listening to this, understand that you are a member of the Lucky Sperm Club. What I mean is if you have money enough to have a device in your hand, a headset in your ear, a car that you're driving in, you were born lucky. And I will say that during this season of the holidays, it is more than just a gesture of goodwill. It is an obligation if you are someone of any type of means to give back. Be a, be a go-giver. Do something great. I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm actually leaving here in 30 minutes to go do this. I got this, stole this idea from Kent, my good friend Kent Clothier. I want to give him credit for it. Um, and it struck a chord with me the first time he told me that he does this. And here's what it is. 
for those of you that don't know how layaway works, um, layaway is when someone doesn't necessarily have enough money and they want to do their kids Christmas shopping early. So they make sure they get whatever the it toy is. So they go into stores like Kmart, stores like Burlington Co. Factory, stores like this. And then they say, here's five or $10 to hold this gift. And I'm going to make payments on it between now and Christmas. Well, December 12th, which is today, um, is the day that the stores will take all the inventory tomorrow and put it back on the shelves if they couldn't do that. So I have gathered up a bunch of our agents here in our company. This is the second time we're doing this this year. We're going to go from here down to Burlington Co. Factory, and we're going to pay off all the layaways. We're just going to pay them all off. So some of them are, are a couple bucks. Some of them are five, ten dollars. It's not even a lot of money to give somebody Christmas. And I don't tell you that because I need the stroke or admiration of you to tell me how great I am. This will not be on my social media. It will not. I didn't call the news. I'm telling you because I want you to hear that story and understand that it doesn't take a twenty thousand dollar investment to give back. You can literally for five or ten dollars and paying off somebody's layaway make their Christmas. So try to find somewhere in this holiday to go be a go-giver and give back. Thank you to Michael Sartain. Make sure you check him out in his program, and we will see you guys next week. What's up, everybody? Thanks for joining us for another episode of Escaping the Drift. Hope you got a bunch out of it, or at least as much as I did out of it. Anyway, if you want to learn more about the show, you can always go over to escapingthedrift.com. You can join our mailing list. But do me a favor, if you wouldn't mind, throw up that five-star review. Give us a share. Do something, man. We're here for you. Hopefully, you'll be here for us. But anyway, in the meantime, we will see you at the next episode.